And we've had a good weekend. Uh, those that were here and helped serve for the live conference, and uh, if you were here this morning, man, what a, what a great time in the presence of the Lord. And uh, I, I hope that every one of us were able to uh, take something from the service this morning and that our lives will never be the same. We're challenged uh, to draw closer to the Lord, challenged to be people of prayer, challenged to hold on and not let go and, and believe God for answers and hold on to his promises. I, I, I'm not sure what the Lord spoke to you, but I, I hope that he did. And if you were not able to be here this morning, I encourage you to get online and, and uh, go back and watch that message. A uh, great, fantastic message. Be in prayer for our students. I believe that times like this where we set aside and kids, students can come in uh, just a, an environment where the expectation is drawn near to God. Uh, that amazing things happen. And then we walk outside the doors and we go back to life the way it was. But life shouldn't be the way it was. And uh, pray for our students. Pray for um, just divine revelations for them that they will cap capture uh, you know, what God wants for them and really just pursue him with all their heart. I'm going to share a message with you tonight. We're talking about tough questions and you might have noticed in your bulletin the question for tonight is how can a loving God send anyone to hell? Maybe you've grappled with this question. Uh, maybe it's something that you've thought about. Maybe it's something you resolved long ago. I don't know. Uh, maybe you've had somebody ask you this question, and you're going, well, you know, I, I'm not really sure what to say or how to, how to answer that. I mean, there's, there's a lot in that question, and there's a lot of assumptions, and uh, some of the assumptions that we can draw from the question, how could a loving God send anyone to hell? One, there is a God. If we're saying, how can a loving God send anyone to hell, we're, we're admitting that there is a God. Uh, the second thing is that not only there is a God, but he's a loving God. And uh, thirdly, that there is a hell that God would send someone to. And if there's a hell, there must be a heaven. The fourth assumption is that God sends people there. So we're going to try to look through this a little bit. I know there's a lot of different angles, a lot of different ways that we can look at this, uh, this question. And I don't want to make it super simple as far as oversimplify but I think sometimes, you know, we, we look for big answers, and sometimes the, the answer is uh, a, a pretty simple one. But we're tackling this question tonight, how could a loving God send anyone to hell? If someone is asking this question, uh, it's most likely, you know, it's, it's in an accusatory uh, way. This is a question that's designed to stump someone. It's... it's probably spoken by someone who is a doubter, who's trying to, to dodge an issue. But I think that there are well-meaning people who might honestly say, this is just something that I don't understand. I don't understand. How could a loving God send anyone to hell? There's some other questions that go with that question. One would be, would God send someone to hell that's never heard the gospel? If Jesus is the only way, what about someone who lived before Jesus lived here on this earth? Or what about someone who lives in a remote part of the world and has never heard the gospel? Would God send that person to hell? So we're going to start by looking in uh, Romans chapter 1. And I'm sorry, I don't have uh, high-tech stuff on the, on the wall for you tonight. If you've got a Bible... Or if you've got a piece of paper, there's pens in the pew there ahead of you. If you want to just jot down some scriptures, uh, and you can go back and, and, and look through these. Um, but we're going we're gonna to use the book style form of the Bible tonight, uh, because I didn't take time to put all that stuff into the computer to shine it on the wall for you. So either write it down, go back and look, or just get your Bible out, thumb through the pages. But Romans chapter 1. Two points that I want to, um, want to uh, address tonight, and the first one is that God is a just God, meaning that God will never give an unjust judgment to any person. 
he is just. Deuteronomy 32, verse 4 says, He is the rock, his deeds are perfect. Everything he does is just and fair. He is a faithful God who does no wrong. How just and upright he is. So we have a God who is a just God. He will never, he will not ever give an unjust judgment to any person. So if God's ever going to give judgment to someone, we are going to say, God is, God is just, meaning he's fair, he's right, and he won't give an unjust judgment to any person. Romans chapter 1, verse 18 to 20, says this, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. So that men are without excuse. We have no excuse because God has made himself known not only within us, but to us. That which is known about God is evident, it says, within us and is made evident to us. Since the beginning of time, God has testified, this is what this scripture tells us, that he has testified of himself to every person so that no person has an excuse for an unrighteous life. God is a just God. So when we ask questions like, this question, how could a loving God send anyone to hell? A lot of times we try to answer a question with our, with our human reasoning or with logic. But this is a question that is a biblical question that I believe, you know, we can't answer that question without the Bible. I believe that the Bible has answers to our questions. This is a biblical, biblical question and the Bible um, has the answer to a lot of tough questions. But no matter how much we argue or debate in our own human intellect, in our logic, it's not gonna help us fully to answer a biblical question. Um, so we need to look at the Bible. And the Bible tells us that God has testified of himself to everyone, and he has done so internally within us, and externally he has testified of himself to us. So I want you to think about this. Every one of us has a conscience a conscience we all have a conscience that conscience comes from God and I believe that God talks to us God speaks to us he reveals himself to us um, I believe even from the time someone is young God speaks uh, into our lives how many of you as a child you you know that you heard from God or God revealed something to you, and it was very evident. As adults, God, God can speak to us. I believe that you can't go out and look up into the sky in an, on, in an evening up at the night sky and wonder at some point in your life, is there really a God? How many of you have ever done that? You've looked up in the sky, you've looked at the stars so vast, and, and you've wondered that question, maybe as a child, maybe as a teen, uh, even as an adult, just saying, you know, I, it's hard to look at what we see out there and wonder and not wonder if there's a God. It tells us that creation testifies of God and God reveals himself to every one of us. All of us have at some point wondered or we have uh, been seeking or desiring to know God. And I hope that is where all of us are, to, to know God, to know about God. And this scripture in Romans is telling us that no one will ever be able to say, no one ever told me. Because what, what we can know about God, God has made it uh, evident within us. He has put something in us, into our heart, and he has spoken something to us. By his creation, he says, I revealed myself to you. I put a desire within you, inside of your heart for me. And it's really us, or humans who have turned 
away from God. The Bible tells us that everybody who seeks God will find God. Let me just share a few verses of, of Scripture. Proverbs eight seventeen. God says, I love those who love me, and those who seek me find me. I love those who love me, and those who seek me find me. Jeremiah 29, 13, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. Matthew chapter 7, 7 to 11, Jesus said, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you for everyone who asks receives. Everyone who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Which one of you, he says, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone, or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake. If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? So we need to ask, we need to seek, and we need to knock. There's something inside of us that desires to know God, and God says, if you seek for me, you're going to find me. Knock on the door, keep on knocking. Seek and keep on seeking. Ask and keep on asking, and he will respond. We heard a great message this morning about being persistent. If we are persistent about pursuing God and looking for God, there is no way, what Scripture is telling us, there is no way that God won't answer that, that question. There's no way he won't open the door when we knock. There's no way that if we ask, he won't respond. He says, if you seek, you will find. He is going to reveal himself to us. Acts chapter 17, verse 26 to 28. For one man... From one man, he created all the nations throughout the whole earth. He decided beforehand when they should rise and fall, and he determined their boundaries. His purpose was for the nations to seek after God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us, for in him we live and move and exist, or some versions say, and have our being. The New King James King James Version in verse 27 says, Seek the Lord in hope that he might grope for him and find him. So, I mean, that, the whole word of grope. I, I, you know, I think of being in the dark. I don't know how many of you ever walk around your house in the dark, but I get up oftentimes before anyone else in my, in my, in my family, and um, Jeannie is a much lighter sleeper than I am, so I'll get up in the dark and walk around my room, and there's plenty of times where I'm, I, I know the contour, you know, if I just brush up against the footboard of my bed, I know how far to where I have to take a left to get into my bathroom. Shut the door, then turn on the light. You know what I'm talking about? I walk around in this building or uh, the buildings over there in the, in, at night when it's dark and I can just find my way around. But um, it, that's kind of the whole groping in the dark, you know, reaching out, trying to, to find something. And he's saying, look, his purpose for the nations is to seek after God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. He's not far away from any one of us. If a person will simply make an effort to find God, God will reveal himself to that person. So no one will ever receive an unjust judgment from a just God. Not only is God just, he is a loving God. So the question is, how can a loving God send anyone to hell? How do we define the word loving if he's a loving God? How does, how does the culture, how does the world out there define loving God? What do they mean when they say, how could a loving God? I think what the, what the culture is saying is that they're looking for a, a God who is non-confrontational, uh, who tolerates anything that I want to do. That's what it means, you know, if I'm loving is I, I you know, I, I can do whatever I want to do. John 4, 16 says God is love. He is the definition of love. God himself is love. He doesn't possess love like we do. He is the very definition of love and he can't do anything that is unloving. If God is love, he can't do anything that is unloving. 
So if someone makes a choice and makes a decision because God has given us a free will and they choose to go this way, what is, what is God going to do? If he is a loving God, is he going to change his mind and treat someone differently? He cannot do anything that is unloving. So answering this question from a, a biblical perspective, last week I shared a message from Matthew chapter 25. If you want to turn there, as I, as I was working on that, that scripture, I'm thinking here is part of the answer uh, to the question that I'm speaking about tonight. Matthew chapter 25. I'm turning to my Bible as well. Remember this passage of Scripture, Jesus is talking about uh, the final judgment, and he's going to separate people like a farmer would separate sheep from goats. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. This is verse 31 of Matthew 25. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. And the king will say to those on his right, these are the sheep, come you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. What do you suppose that is? Heaven? Eternal reward for the sheep? Their sheep? because that's who they are, not because that's what they do. They're a sheep because they have a shepherd. Their shepherd is Jesus Christ. And uh, because of their relationship with Jesus Christ, this is, this is their reward. And, and he goes on to talk about, I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. Uh, and then he goes down to verse 40, um, or verse 41, and he says to those on his left, depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire, Prepared for who? The devil and his angels. So he says to the sheep, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for for you. Heaven was prepared for God's people. But hell was created for the devil and his angels. But there's this separation of sheep and goats And the goats are joining in that punishment. Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. So God did not create hell for people. Hell was created for Satan and his angels. God sent Jesus, his son, so that no one would ever have to go to hell. John 3, 16 and 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him wouldn't perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. So God didn't send, uh, God didn't create hell for people. Jesus came so that we would have a way out of that punishment. Jesus came to pay the price for everyone. Whether or not people knew about Jesus Uh, those who might have come before Jesus or who came after him, so that when a person seeks for God, they can find God and their sins can be forgiven through his sacrifice on, on the cross, his blood that was shed to atone for our sins. Jesus took our place. 2 Peter 3, 9 says, The Lord isn't slow in keeping his promises. Some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but for everyone to come to repentance that's God's plan that's God's desire and he created uh, an eternal reward for us but God also created us with a free will probably uh, one of the greatest gifts that he could give us outside of the gift of Jesus Christ Um, but when he created mankind he created man with a free will he gave us a choice you have a choice you can choose whatever you want to do That's how God created you. Think about it like this. If you are at home, how many of you have a dishwasher? 
Okay, if you're, if you're at home and you got dishes in your dishwasher and you turn that thing on and it's starting to do its job, do you do like a little happy dance because, you know, the dishwasher is actually doing uh, what it was designed to do? You're going, no, it's a machine. And if it doesn't work, the only way you'd be doing a, a happy dance is if the thing has been broken and all of a sudden you got it fixed and you've been doing dishes by hand for months and now all of a sudden it's doing that. You might do a little happy dance. But it's just doing what it was designed and created to do. It's a machine. And it should work that way. But, but ladies, if your husband does the dishes, that's a different story. Because he has a choice if he's going to do that or not. You see what I'm saying? So God created us with a free will. He's given us a choice. Um, and the reason we would celebrate is because, like I said, he didn't have to do the dishes, but he has a free will. He can choose not to do it. But when he does it, that's awesome. So when someone loves you, who doesn't have to love you, that's meaningful. Would God send someone to hell if he's a loving God? No, God wouldn't send someone to hell. But there are a lot of people who are sending themselves to hell all the time based on their choice. Every one of us have a choice. And the decision of our eternal destination is not made by God, it's made by us. He has given us the choice. And as we read, God doesn't want anyone to perish, but instead he wants everyone to come to repentance. We want to blame God for sending people to hell. That's what that question implies. But the reality is he's given us a free will, and he's given us a choice. God is a just God. He's a loving God. But what happens sometimes is Satan gives us all kinds of crazy messages, errors, to turn our hearts against God. He's a thief. Scripture says he's come to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus has come that we might have life and have it abundantly. The reality is, is it's our choice where we spend eternity. If you change someone to a chair and you said to them, I'm so glad that you chose to spend this time with me. That's crazy, right? There's no choice, but here's the deal. None of us are chained to the chair. We all have a choice. Nobody forces you to come to church. Well, maybe some of you. But the reality is, is you're not forced to come to church. You're not forced to accept Jesus. You're not forced to read the Bible. You're not even forced to pray. The only res reason that you would ever do that is because you voluntarily choose to love God. You choose to follow God. It's completely up to you. You're here tonight most likely because you've made that choice. And if you haven't made that choice... I believe that tonight is your night to make that choice. You see, the reality is, is that God chose us before we ever had an opportunity to choose him. The Bible tells us that he chose everyone. God so loved the world. That includes everyone. It doesn't say God so loved Christians, believers. God so loved the world. Ephesians 1.4 says that even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. God chose us. When he sent Jesus to die in our place, he was choosing us again. The only people that will be in heaven with him are those who have chosen him. I want you to turn to Isaiah chapter 5. If you want to put your hand there and turn to math, back to Matthew chapter 21, we'll, we'll end up there. Isaiah 
Isaiah chapter 5, verse 1 to 4, and then we're going to skip a few verses to 11. I will sing for the one I love a song about his vineyard. And in this, in this story, the vineyard is God's people. My loved one had a vineyard on a fertile hillside. He dug it up and cleared it of stones and planted it with the choicest vines. Pastor Austin shared a message that Jesus is the vine, we're the branches. He built a watchtower in it and cut out a wine press as well. And then he looked for a crop of good grapes, but it yielded only bad fruit. Now you dwellers in Jerusalem and people of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more could have been done for my vineyard than I have done for it. When I looked for good grapes, why did it yield only bad? Verse 11, woe to those who rise early in the morning to run after their drinks, who stay up late at night till they are inflamed with wine. They have harps and lyres at their banquets, pipes and timbrels and wine, but they have no regard for the deeds of the Lord, no respect for the work of his hands. Therefore, my people will go into exile for lack of understanding. Those of high rank will die of hunger, and the common people will be parched with thirst. Therefore, death, some of your versions of the Bible might say Sheol, is that correct? Or, or King James says the word hell. Therefore, hell or death expands its jaws, opening wide its mouth, into it will descend their nobles and masses with all their brawlers and re- revelers. So people will be brought low and everyone humbled, the eyes of the arrogant humbled. That's a pretty, pretty sad scripture. Here's, here is his vineyard, his choices of people. They're not producing the right fruit, they're producing bad fruit. And he goes on to say that they're following after all these other things and they have paid no attention They have no regard for the Lord, no respect for the work of his hands. His people go into exile for lack of understanding, and they die of hunger. They're parched with thirst, and it says that death opens wide its mouth. New King James Version says, Sheol has enlarged itself and opened its mouth beyond measure. Here's the thing, hell wasn't created for people. It was created for the devil and his demons. But God said, I planted this vineyard. I gave it every opportunity to succeed, but men chose sin instead of me, and because of that, hell has become enlarged. In the Bible, Jesus talks more about hell than he does heaven. He describes hell more vividly than heaven. Hell is described as a place of eternal torment, of unquenchable fire, where the worm does not die, where people will gnash their teeth in anguish and regret. He calls hell a place of outer darkness, comparing it to Gehenna, which is uh, a, a trash dump outside of the walls of Jerusalem where trash burned constantly and where maggots grew and proliferated. It's a terrible, terrible place. Why does Jesus talk so much about hell more so than heaven? I believe it's because he he loves us and he doesn't want any of us to go there. So Matthew chapter 21. I told you to turn there and I had my finger there and I had to let go of it. How many of you are in Matthew 21? These are words of Jesus, what Jesus says himself. Back in Isaiah, it says that hell was enlarged because the vineyard turned against its owner. Listen to these words, very similar sounding words uh, to Isaiah chapter five. Jesus says, listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard. He put a wall around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. And then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and moved to another place. And when the harvest time approached, he sent his servants to the tenants to collect his fruit. The tenants seized his servants. They beat one, killed another, and stoned a third. Then he sent other servants to them more than the first time. 
and the tenants treated them the same way. Last of all, he sent his son to them. They will respect my son, he said. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to each other, this is the heir. Come, let's kill him and take his inheritance. So they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and they killed him. God didn't design hell. He didn't create it for us. He created heaven for us. He gave us a choice. He gave us a free will for us to choose. Because for us not to be able to choose him, it's kind of like that dishwasher that just does its thing. Of course it does that. That's what it's supposed to do. It's like the guy that's chained there having a conversation with you in his chair. But he's given us a free will so that we can pursue him and choose him on our own. God doesn't send people to hell. That's not really the, 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 the tougher of the questions. I believe that we understand that God doesn't send people to hell. We choose of our own choice what our destiny, our eternal destiny is going to be. God made a way for us. He created heaven for us. But mankind has turned away from him and chosen another path. The bigger question is, how could, how could we reject a loving God? Or how could anyone reject a God who loves them so much? This isn't a choice, I think, that's going to be hard for you and me. But every day we make a choice to follow God. Every day I have the, the propensity to go my own way. I could choose life or death. I could choose blessing or curses. I could choose to go God's way. I could choose to go my own way. But how could we, knowing what God has done for us, knowing how much he loved us, that while we were sinners, he died for us. He demonstrated his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, he died. He gave his life. He demonstrated his love. He's shown his love in such a real way. God created us in his image. He created us for himself. How could we choose anything other than to go the way of a God who loves us that much. So I believe that you all understand this, but here's the thing. There's a whole world out there that doesn't know this. That have chosen to go their own way. That have chosen to do what seems right in their own eyes. It's choosing to go their own way. To choose to use their human reason and human logic to decide what's the best plan What's the best way for me to go? Here's what we need to do. We need to take this light and this message to the world out there. How do we do that? This week, what are you going to do about that? Is there anyone that you know that does not have the light and the love of Jesus in their life? Is there anyone that you know who is choosing a different way? Are there people that you cross paths with, that you rub shoulders with, that you work with, that's in your neighborhood, that is in your family, a friend who doesn't know Jesus, who doesn't have a relationship with Jesus? Here's the reality. There's an eternity for all of us. God so loved the world. What do we do about that? I want you to close your eyes and bow your heads with me as we close service. I want you just to allow the Holy Spirit to speak to your heart. What do you do about this?
Jesus, tonight I pray that as our hearts are open to you, we ask that you would just speak to us. God, you've called us to go and make disciples. You've called us to be the light of the world. You've called us to make a difference. I pray that every one of us in this room that we would realize that we're on a mission. It's so easy for us to forget. It's so easy for us to fall into a routine. It's so easy for us to fall into the trappings of life and forget that we're here on a mission. We lose sight and we, start, and we, we think that our career, our, our job is, is what we're all about. But the reality is, God, you've given us those abilities and you've given us that knowledge to do that job because there is a mission field right where, they, right, where, right where we are, where you've placed us. We're on mission in our neighborhoods. We're on mission in our workplaces. We're on mission in our school. And I pray that we would be the light to the world around us. Jesus, let your light so shine in us that men might see our good deeds and glorify our Father that's in heaven. We know that you love us so much that you didn't, you don't send anyone to hell. You are a loving God. You've created heaven for us, but you've given us a choice. And I pray that our choice to follow you would impact the world around us. God, I pray, pray that you would place people on our hearts. God, that as we leave this place tonight, that there would be someone or some people that we would decide and determine tonight that in the next few days, in the next couple of weeks, that we would pray for them and that we would see opportunities that would come our way to speak life and truth, to let your light shine through our lives, to let your love, God, flow through us to those individuals. God, we believe that you can use us to be on mission in this community, around this city, in the places where you've planted us. your heads bowed and your eyes closed. Is there anyone here tonight? No one's looking around, but and you've, not, you've not made a decision to follow Jesus. You've not exercised your choice to choose Jesus. Or maybe you have at one time and you're just not there right now. And tonight you'd say, I'm choosing to follow Jesus. I'm choosing, making the choice for my eternal destiny. And I'm choosing heaven. Is there anyone here tonight? Heaven is the path that we're all on. So here's what I want to ask you to do. I want you just before you leave tonight to spend some time just you and Jesus. Drawing near to him, he draws near to you. Just let him speak to you and download some of these thoughts as far as who it might be that you can touch, that you can speak to, that you can have a conversation with. Praying for their soul. Praying for a harvest of souls through your life and through your ministry. God, use us is our prayer. Let us be willing and able vessels for you to use to see your kingdom multiplied in this community. Use us, Lord, is our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. I encourage you just to find and continue just to take some time as the music plays just to spend some time in prayer with the Lord and let him speak to you. And when you feel like you're ready, you can be dismissed. Pray that this is a fruitful week for you. That God would send you where he wants you to go. And that you'd be obedient to go where, he, where he's leading you.